Thank you. I'm very happy to be with you again. Uh, last year it was Alzheimer's disease. This year I'm going to talk about breast cancer and specifically focus on the link between obesity and this specific type of cancer and the mechanisms involved. So breast cancer is the most common cancer in women worldwide. And it's also uh, the one that's responsible for the biggest number of cancer deaths. Speak a little bit about the process of carcinogens, carcinogenesis. How does cancer form? We start with a process called initiation. This is the very first step. Typically, this is the one that involves a mutation, uh, a process that would lead to either activation of a gene that leads to excessive growth or to an inactivation to a gene that inhibits tumors. Uh, the cause of initiation can be UV radiation, can be uh, certain hormonal uh, factors, uh, can be uh, exposure to x-ray, it can be anything. And then after that, you need a factor that can promote the cancer. And the most common ones we know about are hormones. And I'm going to talk a, uh, a lot today about estrogen, insulin, insulin-like growth factors as promoting uh, factors for breast cancers. After that, uh, after uh, a number of mutations have accumulated uh, in those cells, uh, progression occurs, meaning that uh, now we have a malignant tumor and it is ready to invade other tissue and metastasize. So this is kind of a frame uh, work or uh, sto the story of kind of every cancer. But with every cancer, there's a different player. OK. Uh, somebody in the audience asked me to address the genetics of breast cancer. That is because uh, a lot of people now are getting uh, genetic tests, and there are some that are relevant to breast cancer. Uh, the graph here shows that actually 90% of breast cancer cases are sporadic. So they're not related to familial uh, or family cases, family history cases, or to uh, inherited genetic mutations. Now we have 10% of the cases uh, that are clustered in families. And in these familial cases, we have different types of genes that are involved. And in those familial cases, we have the genes BRCA1, breast cancer 1, and breast cancer 2 that are responsible of most of familial breast cancer. And this is kind of the most genetic test that you get if you want to test your risk of breast cancer. And then we have also many other uh, risk genes. So the genes that are most common and the ones that contribute uh, to uh, breast cancer, again, we have BRCA1 gene, we have checkpoint homolog 2, and we have P53 gene. Uh, we call it the guardian of the genome. And we also have phosphatase and tensin homolog. So what's common among these is that these are tumor suppressor genes and DNA repair genes. Their job is first to tell the cell cycle to stop. So it tells the cell not to grow and not to divide. Another thing is that it allows, uh, the, uh, activates the expression of enzymes and genes that are responsible for repairing DNA. So if DNA repair does not work, these genes are also responsible of telling the, the cell to commit suicide. And that's what we call apoptosis. And this is why uh, mutations in DNA repair genes and tumor suppressor uh, genes are strong risk factors for cancer. And we have genes of high penetrance, meaning that when an individual has them, they're very likely to get the specific cancer. And with these, we have BRCA1, BRCA2, P53. Uh, so uh, if somebody has them, then they're very likely to have this cancer, breast cancer. We also have moderate penetrance genes, like CHECK2 and ATM. And we also have low penetrance genes. So these are responsible for less number of cancer cases. And they're more like uh, risk factors, or we call them polymorphisms, rather than mutations that lead to the cancer. 
but weaker in terms of breast cancer. Now, to speak a little bit more beyond genes and the breast cancer biology, uh, typically cancers uh, originate from epithelial or mesenchymal origin. In the case of breast cancer, uh, we, uh, uh, those tumors typically form from epithelial uh, origins uh, in the epithelial cells that line the ducts and the lobules of the breast. For more details, so breast cancer can form in the ducts or the lobule of the, uh, of the breast. Uh, it starts pre-invasive, so we call it ductal uh, carcinoma in situ or lobular carcinoma in situ. And then when it becomes invasive uh, and it metastasizes, uh, we call it invasive ductal carcinoma or lobular car carcinoma. The most common of these is the ductal carcinoma. And, uh, sorry, I have to look here. And with these, you know, this is the duct uh, inside uh, the breast. Uh, we have cancers that are called lumina. So their origin is inside the lumen. And these tend to be hormone receptor uh, positive cancer, like estrogen and progesterone receptor positive, while the ones that uh, occur rather uh, outside in the basal cells or the myoepithelial cells, uh, these tend to be uh, estrogen and progesterone receptor positive. And uh, oncologists typically depend on uh, the subtypes of cancer to actually uh, um, choose the treatments for their patients. So here, if we have, for example, uh, uh, like in the luminal B and A, you see that these cancers are estrogen receptor positive uh, or uh, progesterone uh, positive, then the treatment would be to inhibit uh, the production uh, of the hormone or inhibit to the receptor, like with using tamoxifen. On the other hand, there are cancer, breast cancers that do not express these receptors. They have a uh, human epidermal uh, receptor too. And there's an antibody that uh, uh, doctors use, physicians use to inhibit this uh, receptor and therefore inhibit the growth of cancer. So uh, the drug is typically used as Herceptin, for example. In addition to that, uh, we also have triple negative cancers which do not have any of these molecular marks and these tend to be uh, harder to treat. Uh, there's more need for chemotherapy, radiotherapy in this case because uh, we don't have a targeted treatment for those. Beyond genetics, uh, and as I mentioned, since most of the cases of breast cancer are sporadic, we have many uh, environmental factors that are involved in breast cancer, uh, some modifiable and some unmodifiable. Uh, we have the female gender, of course, uh, being old age, uh, also the geographic location being in North America or North Europe, uh, and then uh, having a family history, of course, uh, the breast density, the more dense the breast, the more uh, the risk to develop uh, breast cancer. Uh, in addition to that, we have high dose radiation to the chest, which is why now we are reconsidering and changing the guidelines on uh, breast cancer screening. Uh, don't do it too often. Uh, the, uh, the guidelines were updated recently, so go and check instead of doing uh, the mammogram every six, or, uh, uh, six months or one year. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have early onset of uh, menstruation and uh, late onset of menopause. These are also risk factors. And obesity is also a strong factor uh, to breast cancer, uh, most specifically postmenopausal breast cancer. And I'm sure many of you also know that hormone replacement uh, therapy, birth control pills, these are also providing uh, estrogens and progesterones that can drive tumors. There are also other factors like being tall, uh, history of primary cancers or other pre reproductive cancers, uh, too much alcohol, and socioeconomic status. If high, it leads to higher risk. And also being uh, an Ash of Ashkenazi uh, uh, ancestry.
So let's start a little bit and talk more about obesity. It is currently considered a global epidemic with 10% of adults affected worldwide and 43 million children under the age of five being overweight. Uh, it is typically defined by World Health Organization as having a BMI of more than 30 and in children having a BMI of more ni than 97 percentile. It is a major risk factor for various chronic diseases, including cancer. And here we see that following menopause, uh, if women like lose weight after menopause, then they are less like, likely to get breast cancer. On the other hand, if they gain weight, then the relative risk to get cancer or breast cancer is higher. Moreover, if somebody or a woman gets breast cancer, then her chances of survive, survival are less. So this is, uh, let's say, a poor prognostic factor. It's, this also happens actually in animals and mice. So we have strains of mice that spontaneously uh, develop breast tumors. If we make them obese, then they get those tumors much earlier in life. So why is it important to find the link between obesity and breast cancer? Scientists like to study the mechanisms. Uh, first, because it may be the principal contributing factor to many breast cancer cases. And also, after menopause and after the exposure of a lifetime of many uh, factors that can lead to cancer, then obesity remains a modifiable one. So this is something that we can work on, actually. In addition to that, if we can find the molecular links between obesity and cancer, then we can identify biomarkers, either to develop the targeted treatments or to uh, guide the disease prevention and treatment. So, obesity, we all know or most of us know that it can contribute to insulin resistance. And this insulin resistance contributes to increase uh, insulin levels in the circulation and increase insulin-like growth factor one, both of which uh, can uh, drive the growth of cancer because uh, they are uh, uh, mitogenic by nature. And cancers can actually have receptors to these uh, hormones. In addition to that, insulin actually increases, reduces the production of uh, sex hormone binding globulin. Now, the way that hormones uh, travel in the circulation, usually for a hormone like estrogen, most of it is actually bound to a protein called sex hormone binding globulin. This is because this prevents it of being all available to cells. So we have estrogen that's bound to sex hormone binding globulin, and this is not available for cells. And we have a very small percentage that's actually free uh, to enter the cells and do its function. So with increased insulin, if you're uh, reducing sex hormone binding globulin, then you're making estrogen more bioavailable to cells. In addition to that, in fact, the inflammation that comes with obesity uh, can activate the aromatase enzyme inside the adipose tissue, and this will lead to more production of estrogen inside the adipose tissue. Okay. Uh, both these factors would lead to cell proliferation, and also the uh, obesity and the adipose uh, tissue alterations that occur with obesity lead to altered uh, hormones uh, like adiponectin and leptin, and also increased production of inflammatory cytokines, which activate cellular pathways that favor uh, survival of the tumor cells. So overall, uh, the end uh, outcome of these hormonal alterations that come with obesity is increased cell proliferation, cell survival, and also activation of factor factors that uh, promote uh, the formation of new blood vessels, which is very important for cancer, uh, a tumor to survive. It needs to make new blood vessels so it can bring more food, more resources, and grow. I won't go through this table in uh, detail, but this is just to emphasize that estrogen, positively correlated with BMI, 
It increases the risk of postmenopausal uh, breast cancer, especially the ones that are hormone dependent. It has a different relationship, as a matter of fact, with premenopausal breast cancer. Uh, some evidence suggests that it reduces breast cancer in that case. Uh, also, uh, sex hormone binding globulin, again, this goes down with BMI making estrogen more available. And uh, it's this uh, reduction, of course, will lead to increased menop postmenopausal breast cancer. What I'm saying here is that more SHBG leads to reduction of postmenopausal breast cancer. <coughs> Insulin and IGF-1 both positively correlate with BMI and both uh, increase the risk of uh, either postmenopausal breast cancer and for IGF-1, it especially increases the risk of premenopausal cancers. And premenopausal cancers actually tend to be the ones that are associated with genetic risk factors that you uh, got from your parents. So if somebody has a BRCA1 mutation, they want to keep their IGF-1 uh, checked and at low levels. <laughs> and this is, uh, this is just to show that the rel relative risk uh, of getting breast cancer uh, increases by every 5 kilogram per meter square of BMI by 18%. Uh, uh, according to estrogen, based on estrogen. And when you control for estrogen in this obese population, you see that the relative risk disappears. What does that mean? That means that the obesity linked to cancer is very likely conferred by the increased estrogen and the increased free estradiol or free estrogen. So what's the deal with estrogen? Premenopausal women have their estrogen synthesized in the ovary. Uh, after menopause, the ovaries stop and the adipose tissue starts compensating. And the adipose tissue inside the, the breast also uh, can, uh, uh, can start producing more estrogen. So estrogen will start being produced in adipose tissue all over the body, but uh, uh, the increased aromatase expression in the adipose tissue inside the breast would lead to increased estrogen, and this will be a direct promoter of the uh, cancer cells uh, or the, uh, the cells that have some sort of mutations uh, in them. And that's why the adipose tissue inside the breast serves as a stroma for the growth of cancer. So the cancer does not start in the adipose tissue, it starts in the epithelial cells, but these epithelial cells depend on the adipose tissue to get resources, growth factor, nutrients. It has also been suggested that actually body fat may be a better predictor of postmenopausal breast uh, cancer risk than either body weight or BMI. And this is to show uh, that with BMI, you have more aromatase expression in the adipose tissue, which would be expected to lead to increased estrogen. Now, another alteration that's associated with obesity is the inflammation that comes with it. Uh, so we see here that uh, uh, increased uh, circulating level of C-reactive protein. This is a very common marker of systemic inflammation in the clinical practice. And when this is increased, it increased the chance with every one unit or one milligrams per liter increase in uh, CRP, we are contributing, uh, this leads to 32% increase in breast cancer. And this is also relevant to other cancer, like the lung and the prostate, and so on. So what can we do about that? So we have inflammation, and we have the increased uh, CRP that comes with obesity. Can we control that? Is there a way to change this? So one of the trials is called the Pounds Lost trial. They found that weight loss, irrespective of dietary macronutrient, can reduce serum human, uh, high sensitivity C-reactive protein by 24% at 6, 12, and 24 months. And the CRP reduction was associated with the reduction in markers of insulin resistance. 
In addition to that, weight loss can also uh, reduce uh, the, uh, the free estrogen that's available for cell, and it can increase its bi binding protein, the sex hormone binding protein. So we see here in this diet, uh, I looked at the macronutrient distribution. It was about 30% fat. Uh, they don't say anything about the carbs and protein. And uh, you can see um, that uh, diet alone was able to reduce uh, estrogen levels by 21.4% and exercise by 47 So diet is a stronger factor. Losing weight by diet is a stronger factor. And the combination of diet and exercise is best at reducing the hormone by 28%. And this is another graph uh, from the same paper. Uh, they say, here we look uh, at the sex hormone binding globulin and the changes that occur to these with weight loss. Uh, so with here we have 5% weight loss, we have 5 to 10% weight loss, and the red is more than 10% weight loss. Obviously, more, more than 10% weight loss would lead to better changes or the improvements in hormones. And with sex hormone binding globulins going up as the weight goes down. So that means that you can fix and reduce estrogen availability if you lose weight. And this is for estradiol and free estradiol. Uh, it is obvious that weight loss, especially uh, with 5 and, 10 and more than 10% uh, of body weight or baseline body weight, you can see that this leads to reduction in free estradiol and other hormones that are relative uh, to cancer. So we talked about estrogen. We can reduce estrogen by weight loss. And we talked about CRP. We can also reduce that with weight loss. And then we have insulin, IGF-1, and its connection to cancer. Uh, to repeat, insulin resistance can increase uh, the production, uh, reduce the production of sex hormone binding globulin, making estrogen more available, and by itself can increase IGF-1 receptor expression. And it can also have some sort of cr cross reactivity with IGF receptor. And it can increase IGF-1 uh, in the circulation. Uh, both of these factors would uh, promote mitosis, have anti-apoptotic effects, and promote angiogenesis. Sorry. Yes. In addition to that, other uh, metabolic changes with insulin resistance uh, would lead to inflammation, and that would also uh, drive cell uh, growth and survival. And this, is, this pathway tends to be more relevant in premenopausal breast cancer. So, so far, postmenopausal breast cancer tends to be more of an estrogen story. But of course, because insulin can also drive uh, estrogen imbalances, then it's still relevant. For premenopausal breast cancer, uh, the stronger factors are actually insulin and IGF-1. What can we do about that? Uh, we know that the best way to reduce insulin and IGF-1 is a low carbohydrate diet already. Uh, these are the most effective ways. Also, caloric restriction is, uh, and fasting, prolonged fasting, is very effective in reducing insulin-like growth factor. And in general, for cancer, in the context of cancer, low to moderate protein diets are pre preferable because even too much protein can activate IGF-1 pathway and mTOR pathway, which are also uh, important for cell growth and uh, division. Of course, of any intervention, your ultimate goal must be to reduce cancer incidence, uh, cancer uh, uh, progression, so you want to prevent deaths, and you want to improve quality of life. So any uh, treatment or any diet that can lead to that would be good. Um, I have not seen like clinical trials that show that endpoint. Uh, very clearly, uh, most of the clinical trials depend on the biomarkers, and that's why I focused on those. So in conclusion, the prevalence of obesity as well as breast cancer have been rising worldwide. 
Obesity increases the risk of breast cancer, mainly through increasing the levels of free estrogen, insulin, and IGF-1. Obesity-induced hormonal alterations can be used to guide the prevention and treatment. So, we need to maintain a healthy weight, and I want to distinguish between intentional versus unintentional weight, uh, weight loss, uh, weight loss in breast cancer. So, let's say we are dealing with a woman who already has breast cancer. If she is intentionally eating well, eating enough, and losing weight, this is likely uh, to be a good prognostic factor. But unintentional weight loss, so if a woman has breast cancer and she is losing weight because of loss of appetite, because of pain, because of the medication, uh, for, you know, because the dis disease is progressing, then this is probably not a good prognostic indicator. And in that case, if a woman has a stable disease that's controlled, uh, then weight loss can be beneficial. But if somebody is unintentionally losing weight, in that case, our goal must be to actually improve quality of life, uh, provide uh, quality food, healthy foods, and uh, also promote further, uh, prevent further weight loss. And this can be done by even giving more protein. So it really depends on the stage of the disease and uh, different factors. Also, if somebody is uh, not willing to uh, lose weight, uh, it's been shown that even just improving insulin, insulin levels and IGF-1 levels can have positive effects on the disease. Okay, so low carb or low fat. So both seems to be effective uh, in postmenopausal uh, breast cancer. We can't deny that, and this is because they can both uh, if you're calculating the calories and everything, if you're reducing the calories, they're leading to weight loss. And this will lead to redu reduction in inflammation, reduction in uh, estrogen, in insulin. But low carbohydrate diets, of course, would be better to reduce insulin and IGF-1. And this is critical, especially for people with familial uh, 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 cancers. And always go low carb. Uh, if insulin resistance exists. So we have a postmenopausal woman, uh, we have a postmenopausal woman who is insulin resistant, then preference should be given to low carb. Uh, again, low carb is very important for premenopausal women and BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers. Fast, but of course then eat well, uh, plant-based diet, uh, and move because exercise has an effect that's independent of weight on cancer prevention and positive treatment outcomes in cancer. Sleep because uh, 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 dysfunctional uh, sleep rhythm is uh, a risk factor to breast cancer. Also increase the intake of what we call cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, like uh, cabbage, uh, like arugula, all these good stuff. They tend to have uh, anti-tumor effect, even though the evidence is not super strong in that aspect. But the bioactive compounds in, in them tend to be protective against cancer. Uh, vitamin D, maintain above 30 uh, nanograms per ml, especially if you're dealing with a patient and avoid smoking and limit alcohol. Avoid environmental toxins like xenoestrogens, uh, and these are compounds that have estrogenic effects. They can bind to the estrogen receptor in the breast, and they can promote cancers. Uh, of these are parabens, which are very commonly used in many cosmetics, in shampoos, in lotions. Uh, you put them on your skin and they disappear. That, mean, that means they're going to your cells and to your circulation. In addition to that, uh, plastic containers which contain uh, BPA and B BPS, uh, also these have estrogenic effects. So you see a lot about BPA-free uh, bottles or whatever, but uh, these bottles actually have BPS, so they're not really better. Glass is better. It's just a mar marketing strategy. And we need future studies to understand how obesity uh, influences different types of breast cancers. Uh, I mean the molecular subtypes. 
and which diets are better for different types of breast cancer. In addition to that, we need comparative uh, clinical trials to evaluate the role of different macronutrient distributions on breast cancer. So we need really uh, studies that bring two groups of people or three and show the effect of uh, isocaloric diets, low carb, low fat, and see which does better. I couldn't find such study in the literature. <laughs> so thank you for listening. Any questions? If there are any questions, if you just line up by the mic over there on that side of the room. Hello. Mm -hmm. um, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, as somebody who's now in middle age <laughs> and pursuing strength sports, wondering if you have any commentary around that, um, you know, in the realm of fitness. I often hear more aerobic type fitness mentioned, so more on the muscle gaining type fitness. I believe that most types of exercise, aerobic and aerobic, are important, even though the study I showed is, uh, is, more, uh, is more about, uh, they used aerobic exercise, but anaerobic is also important for maintaining muscle mass, uh, reducing the fat mass, which is what's providing estrogen, and also it directs resources or nutrients towards the muscles instead of somewhere else, like to tumors. Uh, so definitely, anaerobic exercise uh, is good, if not for cancer, for everything else, probably. Thanks, Rand. That was really great. Thank you. Um, excellent research. Now, I know you had a list of things that we need to do to um, live a lifestyle that is preventative. You had the movement and that type of thing. What are like your three easiest things to do to change our lifestyle and get the biggest bang for our return on investment of time or, or even money? Um, I'd say uh, focus on uh, general the quality of the food, not just the quantity. And even though many people say that uh, calories are irrelevant and that weight is less important, actually we have... Uh, tons of data that show that these indicators are important. So um, uh, avoid uh, like too much weight loss uh, on the long run, that can be uh, not a good thing. And uh, exercise and sleep is actually a very important uh, factor for, uh, for cancer. Uh, I think it's the basics for, for health uh, and prevention of any disease. So eat well, uh, exercise, uh, sleep, and for cancer, uh, fast. So don't be always eating. Let's say we all have periods or days when we overeat. Uh, maybe our body needs it. But then after that, give yourselves a, a chance to burn the fuel, um, be it intermittent fasting, or if you have a high risk, then consider prolonged fasting for three days or so, and then follow that with a healthy diet. You don't have to starve all your life. Just if you can do periodic uh, uh, prolonged fasting and then follow that with healthy diet, uh, plant-based diets, uh, avoiding overnutrition would be a good thing. Because, uh, because fasting actually can activate DNA repair genes, can activate tumor suppressor genes. So I'm a fan of this approach. So is it the autophagy uh, that helps with uh, cancer prevention during the fasting process? Uh, what, what autophagy does in this context, if it's beneficial, is to help you get rid of uh, excessive proteins. Uh, also, dysfunctional proteins uh, helps you deal with the overnutrition or the excess nutrition uh, nutrients that are stored in, inside the cells. So that's why it's good. But another aspect is actually the activation, direct activation of DNA repair genes and tumor suppressor genes with fasting. Uh, so that's also very important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, great talk. Um, there was a, something in the media a couple years ago regarding DCIS and um, whether it's even considered cancer anymore. Um, I know my mother was diagnosed with it many years ago and very aggressively treated like they did back then with tamoxifen and mm -hmm. radiation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess you, you, it was on your chart, and I'm just wondering if, and you might not be able to answer this, but if that's even how you feel about classifying that. And then I guess that touches on the larger 
um, issues, which you did mention, of uh, overdiagnosis and overtreatment and these kinds of things and the uh, dangers of those? Thank you. That's a good question, and it's relevant to other cancers, even for the prostate. Uh, so even scientists uh, disagree on whether cancer is a cancer when it's still contained inside uh, you know, its original uh, location. Um, my cancer pathology teacher uh, said once that if it does not metastasize, then it's not cancer. But this becomes a kind of philosophical uh, argument. Uh, some physicians prefer to treat the cancer before it starts invasion, and others uh, prefer, uh, uh, you know, watchful waiting, uh, waiting and see how the cancer progresses. But I think, you know, the fact that we have, we can use uh, molecular uh, risk factors uh, and also and molecular subtypes of certain cancers and genetic risk factors uh, can all be considered when we decide whether we should uh, treat uh, the patient or not to avoid overtreatment and overdiagnosis. Uh, so I'm not the one who makes this decision. I'm not an oncologist. Uh, you know, I'm a pathophysiologist. I study how diseases occur. Uh, I'm a nutritionist, uh, but I'm not the one who decides uh, when or not to treat. But it's just uh, I want you to be aware that this is uh, this is uh, a kind of a topic of debate among scientists to treat or not to treat and when to treat.